one of the most important functions of the United States government is the formulation and administration of foreign policy. In the long history of the United States, no man has contributed more to the development of general principles for American action in foreign affairs than John Quincy Adams. He was born in 1767 in Quincy, Massachusetts. His father, John Adams, who later became second president of the United States, was a prosperous New England lawyer. His mother, Abigail Smith, was the daughter of Massachusetts' most eminent minister. Where's Philadelphia, Father? What, right there in Pennsylvania, son. It's rather far, but it's in the center of the colonies, and all the delegates to the Congress will get there quickly. Still, I wish the Continental Congress was in Boston. That's an Adams for you. Already wants to have his say in politics. What's that line, Johnny, about patriotism? You know the one I mean. No? Alexander Pope? No, no. You spoke the whole thing for me not long ago. James Thompson, in the season. In this rank age, much as the Patriots' weeding hand requires. Remarkable. You know, Abigail, the Adams have always been considered bright. But genius comes high, even in our family. <laughs> That'll be enough, Samuel Adams. Young John is quite aware of his good qualities without being blown full of overzealous praise by two glib politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Abigail. Now, John, you must take good care of your mother. Keep to your classics. We'll continue our readings together just as soon as I return. Come on, John. We have an appointment in Philadelphia. John and Samuel Adams kept their appointment in Philadelphia. And it wasn't long before young John Quincy Adams heard the firing of the war's first volleys from Bunker Hill. As the revolution became an established fact, and John Adams assumed his integral part in it, he was sent to Paris on a diplomatic mission. Accompanying him was his promising young son, who at 16 became personal secretary to his father. Negotiations were underway to complete the final treaty of peace between England and the United States. These meetings with the French and British, they bow each other into the ground. A diplomat learns patience, John, and integrity. He represents his country under the most trying of circumstances. In peace treaties, such as this, he must not lose on paper what was won so dearly on the battlefield. Well, if I'm ever to work in foreign relations, I could have no better teachers than yourselves. The treaty is yet to be consummated, John. But when it is, you will note that all the apparently useless protocol went to make an extremely practical result. Isn't there something I could do now, Father? There'll be time, son. First, you must go to Harvard. You'll find one step at a time is the best pace. After watching the signing of the Peace Treaty of 1783, John Quincy Adams sailed home to Harvard. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa when he was 20 years old, and three years later was admitted to the bar. But his early ambition for the career of a diplomat returned, and he was sent as United States Minister to the Netherlands, and later to Poland. On the way home from this mission, John Quincy Adams went to England, where he married Louisa Johnson. Once back in the United States, he was sent to the Senate by Massachusetts legislature. That is the question before this Senate committee. President Jefferson's demand for an embargo against Great Britain. But there are among us Federalists, men who love England above well, their Senator Bradley, if I may. Admittedly, the section I represent is Federalist and desires no action against Great Britain which might disturb trade and finance. But we have a right to the freedom of the seas, which England has chosen to infringe upon. We must show strength, and we must hurry to pass this embargo. I would not deliberate. I would act. Adams, you can't do this. This would ruin New England. You're crossing the party line. Well, I suppose this is bad politics, and this measure will cost you and me our seats. But private interests must not be put in opposition to public good. Principle one out and Adams' constituents remembered. He lost his seat in the Senate. But America was growing, spreading its shoulders, and foreign nations were beginning to notice the young giant and ask questions. A man was needed to furnish the answers. President James Madison sent Adams to Russia, then to Ghent, to negotiate the Treaty of Peace with England. And so, Clay, I very much distrust the intentions of the British plenipotentiaries. 
Can't you see what they're doing? <laughs> easy, Adams, easy, and give me an inkling, huh? Now, they're forcing this commission into a choice. Either we sacrifice the interest of my eastern section in the fisheries to secure the interest of your western section to exclusive navigation with the Mississippi, or vice versa. They won't let us have both. Their purpose is to divide us and hope that whichever section loses out will break away from the Union. Well, I see no immediate solution. They're hard bunch to bluff. Well, we don't have to bluff. Since our country is getting stronger every day in international circles, time is on our side. We can afford to play a waiting game. They cannot. Therefore, we must leave the issues of the fisheries in the Mississippi undecided for the moment. The time will arrive for their settlement under conditions favorable to the United States. Well, whether it's bluff or brains, Mr. Adams, it's in our hands. With the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812, John Quincy Adams saw to it that American foreign policy acted in the interests of a united nation and for the benefit of all. In recognition of his success abroad, James Monroe appointed Adams Secretary of State. Here he could use his diplomatic wisdom and skill to strengthen America's position in the Society of Nations. His first task was Florida. John, it's after midnight. We are setting a bad example for Charles. I've just managed to take his books away from him and send him off to bed. Well, after all, dear, he's 12 now. It's time to start training a young diplomat. Heaven forbid. I refuse to sacrifice both my men to the foreign service. And it's awfully late. I know. But this is the most important assignment I've ever faced. The treaty with Spain? The determination of the peoples of the Western Hemisphere to control their own destinies is winning out. Florida now belongs to its rightful claimant. But we've won much more than I've dared to hope. And it's ours. I were not all the Spanish claims. Louisa, what we've won today is the acknowledgement of a definite line of boundary across the entire continent. And we've strengthened our claim to Oregon. Imagine, all that land. Why, I suppose this makes us larger than even England. You should be very proud of your husband. I first proposed the transcontinental boundary. I stand in awe, sir. It had never been thought of before me, not even in the Louisiana Purchase. I must set this down in my diary. Your pride is showing, Secretary Adams. Why don't you allow someone else to set it down for history? Well, I do not seek glory for glory's sake, Louisa. But history is history. And the decision to demand a transcontinental boundary is known to be mine. Perhaps only to the members of the present administration. It may, perhaps, never be known to the public. And if ever known, will soon and easily be forgotten. John Quincy Adams was right. No single individual in the whole history of the United States has won a greater diplomatic victory than the treaty with Spain, which laid the foundation for the United States' expansion to the Pacific. And none has been less glorified. By 1821, John Quincy Adams saw that if the United States was going to spread over the entire North American continent, the opposition of other nations must be overcome. Mr. Adams, my government is quite concerned about your attitude on the Northwest Coast situation. Now, I'm quite sure... Mr. Canning, has your government any claim to the mouth of the Columbia River? What do you mean, sir, any claim? Well, you claim India. You claim Africa. You claim the moon. No. I have not heard that you claim exclusively any part of the moon. But there is not a spot on the habitable globe which I could affirm you do not claim. And there is none which you may not claim with as much color of right as you can have to the Columbia River or its mouth. <laughs> and uh, how far would you consider the exclusion of the right to extend? To the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Suppose Great Britain should undertake to make a settlement We would there. object. We have come to the conclusion that there would be neither policy nor profit for the British government in quarreling with us about territory on the North American continent. And uh, Canada? We have no disposition to encroach upon what is yours, but leave the rest of the continent to us. No more foreign colonies, Mr. Canning. That is our policy. But Russia has long claimed much territory of the Northwest Coast. As I told the minister from Britain only a few minutes ago, no more foreign colonies on the continent. We will recognize all your claims north of 55 degrees north latitude. But that is not enough. 
Perhaps the United States is interested in colonization. Never. Colonies are incompatible with the essential character of our institutions. But we are interested in making the United States an identical geographical element with the North American continent. Let me repeat, Baron Twill. The United States is assuming the principle that the American continents are no longer subjects for any new European colonies. Did you say continents? And that would mean... South America as well. For a new nation, the United States makes many demands. And we endeavor to enforce them. And so, Adams used blunt but masterful diplomacy to turn ambitious eyes away from the North American continent. But in 1823, a new threat arose. It was rumored the Holy Alliance was preparing to pounce on the newly born republics of South America. I would accept a British proposal that together with England, we might actually defend the entire hemisphere against foreign aggression. With foreign protection, the United States hides behind the skirts of Mother England. Thank you, no, Mr. Calhoun. We should not come on as a cockboat in the wake of a British man of war. President Monroe, I lump England with the rest of Europe. If we go along with her on this, we give our tacit approval to further British colonization of the Americas. What do you suggest, Adams? I would make an American clause and adhere inflexibly to that. I would reaffirm our belief that people have a right to govern themselves and not be subject to the domination of any foreign power. This is our cause. This, our responsibility. It is new, it is free, almost all of it. We must protect it at any risk, by ourselves. In other words, we will fight to keep Europe out of this hemisphere. And we will fight alone, if necessary. December 2nd, 1823, James Monroe, in his message to Congress, stated the three principles of John Quincy Adams. Non-colonization, abstention, and hands off the new world, the Monroe Doctrine. In 1824, the House of Representatives elected John Quincy Adams President of the United States, despite a popular vote which favored Andrew Jackson. Though he constantly strived to lead the nation successfully, Adams failed to win popular support. And in the next campaign, John Quincy Adams' party deserted him for the more robust leadership offered by the hero of New Orleans. Mr. Richardson. Mr. Richardson, I refuse to allow Mr. Adams to go through the abuse of another presidential campaign. Oh, no, dear lady. We need Mr. Adams in Congress. His election there is already assured. A past president run for Congress? But, Louisa, don't you see? Slavery is beginning to divide our nation, corrupt our expansion. I can't ignore the importance of the issue. Your return to Washington will be a great blow to the forces of slavery. The people will realize the gravity of the situation. Is there to be no rest, sir? The United States can never influence Europe to abandon imperialism while she countenances slavery within her own borders. John Quincy Adams served a total of 22 years in Congress. But by 1839, the House was so divided on the slavery question that only the old man eloquent himself by assuming the speaker's chair and forcing the representatives to elect a leader could bring order out of chaos. But soon, the movement to gag the cause of anti-slavery in Congress was at its height. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I offer a resolution that no petition, resolution, or paper relating to slavery or the abolition of slavery or the slave trade be received or in any manner entertained by this body. Mr. Speaker! The chair recognizes Mr. Adams. Mr. Speaker, I object to the resolution as being out of order. I hold the resolution to be a violation of the Constitution and of the right of petition of my constituents and of the people of the United States and of my right to freedom of speech as a member of this House. In the voting that followed, the gag rules were adopted by the House and the right of petition with regard to slavery was abolished. John Quincy Adams began a single-handed fight to retain the fundamental American right of petition until the repeal of the despotic gag rules was achieved. Anti-slavery was on the march. Oh, Charles Francis. It's good to see you, son. Any news as to where the State Department will send you? Well, not yet, Father. I 
I've come to you for a little encouragement. I, I feel so inadequate. Well, what's this, a new cane? It's an ivory cane, made from a single tooth, mind you. Mm. Right of petition triumphant to John Quincy Adams. An excellent weapon to ward off the southern opposition. It is a vain memorial, my son. Today, the admission of Texas into the Union as a slave state was forced through the house. The cause of slavery has won its greatest victory. And I shall return that cane. Father, you first started us on the march to expand over the entire continent. We must block that expansion. It means nothing now but the spread of slavery. But you believe in expansion. Texas is your victory. And your belief in the abolition of slavery will win out too one day. What is it you always say? A stout heart and clear conscience and never despair. Isn't that it, Father? You must take this cane, Father, as a challenge to me. A challenge? That you will carry on in the Adams tradition, eh? Very well, Charles. It's a good tradition. But here is your real challenge, Charles. As one diplomat to another, I leave it to you. At the age of 81, John Quincy Adams, diplomat, statesman, and friend of liberty, died at his desk in the House of Representatives. During his lifetime, he had shaped the basic principles of American foreign policy and set the stage for a transcontinental United States. His contribution to freedom was international in scope. Indeed, his standard of international conduct is that followed by free nations of the world today. <laughs>